What happens when you put ice outside on a nice day? Obviously it melts. We can think about it on an atomic level. As you increase the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy. Eventually the molecules over partially overcome the intermolecular forces between the molecules. And so you go from being the solid into the liquid. And so that's at the atomic level. Is there another way of thinking about that, say on the macroscopic level of why ice melts on a hot day? And simply, it's just that ice is the most stable form below zero degrees Celsius. The liquid is the most stable form between zero and hundred degrees Celsius. And so all systems to tend towards the configuration that, that is the most stable, the lowest potential energy or the lowest Gibbs free energy. And so this video is about the most stable configuration of a system or equilibrium. This is very important. It's, it's a main part of chemistry. All systems tend towards a configuration that is the most stable, the lowest free energy. Um, equilibrium is about what is the most stable configuration for a system. Understanding equilibrium is essential for understanding chemistry. And also the concepts of equilibrium can be applied to other fields. We can use it for obviously for chemistry. We can also talk about physics, biology, economics. Systems in general tend towards the lowest energy. And that's all we're talking about. After watching this video, you should be able to relate the parameters to each other quantitatively and qualitatively. And so change the entropy of the universe, change the enthalpy, change the entropy of the system, um, change the Gibbs free energy, K. Please remember that if there's no subscript, then it's for the system. And so delta S universe, you see the universe there. DS, without the subscript, that means for the system. You should probably identify the similarities and differences between Q and K. Q is reaction quotient, K is the constant. You should be able to write down expressions for Q for a reaction, determine Q for a reaction. You should be able to determine how a system will reach equilibrium. Is it going to form more products, more reactants? Given the relative values of Q and K, determine if the forward or reverse reaction is faster. You should be able to determine concentrations at equilibrium and identify the characteristics of equilibrium at the macroscopic and at the atomic level. So these are the goals for this video. And so it's all related to the, to the second law of thermodynamics. You should know your laws of thermodynamics. The second law just says that every spontaneous change increases the entropy of the universe. And so basically, if you know how a process is going to affect the entropy of the universe, you'll know will it happen by itself or not. Again, please remember spontaneous in this case does not mean instantaneous, just means will occur without any outside intervention. You should also remember entropy is a measure of the possible number of configurations. It's equal to Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of W, where W is the number of configurations. It is not, 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 not a measure of disorder. And so if you remember, we can think about the universe as composed of the system plus the surroundings. And we say that the only thing that can be transferred between the system and the surroundings is heat and work. And so the only thing that can change the entropy of the surroundings is basically heat. So delta H is defined as heat transferred to the system under constant pressure and expansion and work. And so delta S of the surroundings is equal to minus delta H over T. And so we have delta S universe equals delta S system minus delta H over T. If we multiply through by minus T, we get minus T delta S universe equals minus T delta system plus delta H. And we can define delta G, the Gibbs, change in Gibbs free energy, as minus T delta S of the universe. And so this is kind of cool. Now we've gone from the second law of thermodynamics that says that if it increases in the universe, it's going to be spontaneous. And now we've related it to a delta G, which is chemical potential energy, a form of chemical potential energy. And so delta G is about the system, delta H is about the system, and delta S about the system. And so the Gibbs free energy is equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system. One of my favorite equations. And so if delta G is positive, that means delta S of the universe is negative, and that would correspond to the non-spontaneous process. If delta G is negative, delta S universe is positive, that corresponds to a spontaneous process. Now again, always watch out for those subscript, uh, the subscripts. And so notice that we we're saying that delta G is equal to minus T delta S of the universe. And we're also saying delta G equals delta H minus T delta S of the system. So delta S system, delta S universe, two different things. Now we can actually determine Gibbs free energy in three different ways. Delta G equals minus T delta S of the universe. We can do delta G is products minus reactants. Again, um, G is a state function. Or we can do delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Again, three different ways of calculating, basically this, of calculating the same value. Now if we think about the reaction. Um, and so for the reaction, the products are always defined what's on the right. And the reactants are always defined 
what's on the left. Notice that in this case we have double arrows, meaning that the reaction go forward or reverse. Even when the reaction is going to reverse, we call the thing on the right products and we call the thing to the left of the arrows as reactants. Now on the plot, we have the Gibbs free energy on our y-axis and we have what's referred to as a reaction quotient on the x-axis. And the reaction quotient we'll use to monitor the reaction. And so when Q is equal to zero, that means we have only reactants. When Q is infinite, that means we have only products. And so delta G is products minus reactants. Again, capital sigma is, is the sum signs. And so here we have a positive delta G, and so that means that the reactants are more stable, and so it's going to be a non-spontaneous process. I should also mention that notice that delta G naught, the little superscript zero, is for standard conditions, and so that's the difference between the products and reactants. Delta G without the superscript zero is non-standard conditions. Now I mentioned that reaction quotient, the x-axis, we use to monitor the progress of the reaction, and so that's products over reactants. And so notice that it's going to be the concentration of the products, and the concentrations are to the power of the coefficient, and so, and then over the concentration of the reactants, and again the concentrations are to the power of the reactants. And so if delta G naught is greater than zero, then it's referred to as non-spontaneous reactant favor reaction, because they're getting the reactants have lower potential energy, lower energy, and are more stable. If delta G is less than zero, again, it's products minus reactants. If it's less than zero, that means the products are a smaller number, a smaller, lower energy, and so more stable. And so if delta G naught is less than zero, that's spontaneous product favored. Again, that corresponds to delta S universe of being positive. Now in delta G naught, we always look at products or reactants, we're not looking at the stuff in between. Now, once we think about the stuff in between, we notice that the mixtures have higher entropy and hence will have a lower Gibbs free energy. Remember, delta G is minus delta H over, sorry, minus, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And so if S is bigger, that means you got that negative. And so delta G goes down. And so typically you'll have the minimum would be somewhere in between of having pure reactants and pure products. And so that minimum is the lowest free energy, it's the most stable configuration. And so that's where the system should end up at. That's what we're going to call the equilibrium position. And so if we start with all reactants, eventually we get to the position of the lowest free energy, the most stable configuration. We do not know how fast this will occur, we just know that eventually we'll get to the most stable configuration. If we start with all products, eventually we get to the most stable configuration. That's going to be our equilibrium position. If we start somewhere in the middle, again, we always end up at the most stable configuration. That's the lowest energy. We just don't know how long it's going to take. Thermodynamics is different than kinetics. Kinetics is about rates. Thermodynamics is not about rates. We do not know how fast the reactions are going to proceed. And so the reaction quotient Q we use to monitor the reaction. And so when we have only react reactants, Q is zero. When we have only products, Q is infinite. And then during the reaction, the Q will change. K defines the, the minimum, the most stable configuration. K is a constant for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. So K, constant specific reaction, specific temperature. Q changes as the reaction changes. And so if we look at a reaction, here we have iron and ions plus thiocyanate going to iron and thiocyanate. And no matter where we start, we'll end up at the same place. And so you notice that we have three initial conditions. The top graph is when we start with only reactants. And you notice that on the top part of the top graph, you have Q. And you see that eventually Q starts at zero because we're starting with all reactants. And eventually Q hits K. On the bottom left, we're starting with equal concentra concentrations of products or reactants. And so Q is a little bit less than K. And the reaction proceeds, we'll end up with Q equal to K. On the bottom right, we're starting with all products, and so Q is basically infinite. And when the reaction proceeds, eventually it'll get down to Q equals K. K is the same in all three plots. And so no matter where you start in the plot, you always end up the same place, the most stable configuration. Initially, only complex formation is possible. As the product concentration increases, the dissociation rate increases until finally both rates are the same. And so if we start with only reactants, we end up at that place, at the same, at equilibrium. If we start with only products, 
Initially, the dissociation rate is faster than its formation. As the reactant concentrations increase, the rate of formation increases until finally both rates are the same. And so no matter where you start on that graph, if you start with all reactants, all products, somewhere in between, you always end up at the most stable configuration. That's equilibrium. Now again, it's very confusing for Q and K. Q changes. Its reaction quotient is defined at the time. So it will change as the reaction proceeds. K is a constant for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. And so at equilibrium, Q equals K. Initially, if you start all reactants, Q will be less than K. Initially, if you start with all products, Q will be greater than K. K, constant for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. Q changes with the reaction. One confusing thing is that they look exactly the same. They're both products of reactants, coefficients become exponents. But again, Q monitor the reaction. K defines the most stable configuration. And so if Q is less than K, you have more reactants than that equilibrium. If Q is greater than K, you have more products than that equilibrium. If Q equals K, that means you're at equilibrium. And so one way you can kind of think about it is that Q and K both monitor, or both measure the position of the boulder. Q measures the position of the boulder as it's moving or at all times. K measures the final position of the boulder. And again, the boulder always ends up at the bottom. And so if Q is less than K, we know that product reactants will form more products until you get to equilibrium. If Q is greater than K, products will form more reactants until we get to equilibrium. And so macroscopically, at equilibrium, the system seems static. There's nothing changing. Concentrations are constant. Microscopically, the reactions are still occurring. It's just that the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. When a solution of iron-3 nitrate is added to a solution of sodium thiocyanate, the red-orange iron thiocyanate complex ion is formed. Although the reaction looks complete, substantial amounts of iron ion and thiocyanate ion remain unreacted in solution. And so again, at equilibrium, macroscopic looks static. But microscopically, you still have the forward reaction, you still have the reverse reaction. It's just that the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are the same, and so there's no change in concentration. When iron-3 ions contact thiocyanate ions in solution, they can react to form a complex ion, iron thiocyanate. As the reaction proceeds, product molecules can react in the reverse direction to separate and reform the original ions. Eventually, the concentrations of products and reactants become constant. At this point, the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal, and the system is in a state of dynamic equilibrium. And so when Q is less than K, we know that reactants will form products until we get to the most simple configuration. And the only way that actually happens is if the forward reaction is faster than the reverse reaction. If Q is greater than K, we know that products will form more reactants until we get back to equilibrium. And again, the only way that works is if the reverse reaction is actually faster than the forward reaction. When Q equals K, that means we're at equilibrium and the rates of the forward reaction equal the rate of the reverse reaction. And so for equilibrium, macroscopically, concentrations are constant. And so the plot on the left, we have A going to B. And so initially we have just reactants and some of the reactants are converted to products. And so you see the concentration of A going down the reactant and B going up the product. And then eventually we get to the concentrations are constant. And so that means equilibrium was achieved. Now, if we look at the rate of the forward reaction, rate of reverse reaction, initially the rate of the forward reaction is fast. And then as the concentration of A is consumed, the rate of the forward reaction gets a little bit slower. Initially, the rate of reverse reaction is zero, but as concentrates in products increase, the rate of reverse reaction increases. Then eventually, the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of reverse reaction, and again, that corresponds to equilibrium.